Welcome to the SITREP Speaker Series. I'm Frank Thorpe, President and CEO of the Navy Memorial, and thank you very much for joining us today. Today's online, interactive, live program is produced by our new organization, Navy Memorial Digital Productions, as part of the Navy Memorial, and we're doing it with the assistance of Alanji Media. We're sponsored today by Navy Mutual Aid Life Insurance, who co-sponsors the entire series for the year, as well as the sponsor for the event today, is General Dynamics. We literally could not do what we do here at the Navy Memorial. We could not honor, recognize, and celebrate the men and women of the sea services, past, present, and future, and inform the public about their service. We couldn't do that without their support. We're honored today to have the 32nd Chief of Naval Operations with us, Admiral Mike Gilday. Admiral Gilday is a person who, knows, who needs no introduction and quite frankly wants no introduction, um, but I think it's important to state, commanded two destroyers, commanded Carrier Strike Group 8, commanded the 10th Fleet, and the Navy's Fleet Cyber Command. CNO, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule and joining us today. Frank, it's great to be here. It's an honor to be here. Three quick thank yous before we uh, take in all lines and get underway. First, I'd like to thank you, and I'd like to thank uh, the Navy Memorial for what you do for the United States Navy and for the public and for educating them uh, on the greatest Navy, uh, about the greatest Navy in the history of the world. The second is um, to thank your sponsors, um, not only Navy Mutual Aid, but General Dynamics for this uh, particular uh, uh, event today. So thanks to them. And lastly, I'd like to thank the audience for tuning in uh, to ask some tough questions hopefully today and uh, to talk a little bit about what's going on in the Navy and, and where we're headed. Uh, so just briefly, my, uh, my focus really is uh, twofold. One is on the day-to-day -day, uh, readiness of the fleet. Uh, so the fleet that's out there today on a day-to-day -day basis, about a third of our fleet is always at sea. Uh, a good portion of that is deployed forward where they need to be. So that has my primary focus. I'm also focused on the investments we have to make uh, to maintain a, a, a relevant, lethal, capable Navy in the future. I know that our questions today are going to get to some of that, and I look forward to discussing that in more detail. Today, uh, we've got about a, a little over 100 ships that are underway, and as I mentioned, most of those are forward deployed. Um, doing some really hard work, I'll give a few examples. The Iwo Jima ARG is up in the high north right now, off of Norway, about to kick off a big exercise. And uh, as you probably know, uh, our, our uh, operations up in the high north and the Arctic are no longer rare. Uh, in the last uh, 12 to 18 months, we've done 20 different operations and exercises up in the high north most of those with allies and partners, uh, many of them with the United States Marine Corps and the United States Coast Guard. Uh, we continue a steady drumbeat in the Middle East, uh, in the Arabian Gulf. Right now, the, the, uh, uh, the Ike Strike Group is on station, uh, providing overwatch as we, as we change our mission in Afghanistan from one of counter-VEO or violent extremist organizations to uh, strategic withdrawal. And so uh, it's a... Uh, Tenuous time in the country of Afghanistan as, as we withdraw the coalition force. Ike is there to make sure that if anything happens, that we're ready to respond and respond quickly uh, and effectively. Uh, in the Western Pacific, uh, that drumbeat continues. Um, uh, as Aqu Admiral Aquilino uh, just took over as the commander of Indo-PACOM last week, uh, leave no doubt in your mind that the Navy will continue to play a vital role forward. He has uh, right now, he's got the Theodore Roosevelt Carrier Strike Group and the Macon Island ARG up north in the Gulf of Alaska doing a joint exercise up there. The Gerald R. Ford just pulled in uh, about a week or so ago. Uh, she's done extended operations out at sea as she gets ready to enter the next phase of her cycle, which will actually be shock trials. She's done over 8,000 cats and traps over the past year and has maintained an, uh, an op tempo that really has rivaled any other, any other ship in the fleet. I can't tell you how excited I am and how proud I am of today's United States Navy and how optimistic I remain about where we're headed. Most of that uh, falls on the sailors that I've come in contact with every single day. And uh, as you know from your time in uniform, every time that I meet with them, it's uplifting and it's informative. Uh, they hold nothing back in terms of telling me how they think we're falling short as a Navy and also where we're, th where we're doing really well and we need to uh, we need to continue. Particularly, their insights over this past year as we've operated through the pandemic have been most helpful for me. So with that, uh, as, as kind of an introduction, I open it up to, to the audience and any questions that you might have. 
Well, thank you, CNO. And uh, we've, we've actually have questions coming from a couple different directions. We've got some good questions from the fleet. We'd uh, like to send your way. Great. And also, for the folks in the audience, uh, you'll see on the platform there's a, a place for you to ask questions. Please do. CNOs uh, encourage us to, to take those questions from the audience. And there's also a way to like the question. So the question that gets the most likes floats to the top, and it floats to the top here on my iPad. Uh, so, CNO, let me, uh, let me get started with a question. And you talked a little bit about mm -hmm. uh, uh, going out and visiting with, with the troops and the sailors. Um, being in the Navy, being in the sea service is hard. It's tremendously rewarding, mm -hmm. and it's hard. These are pretty difficult times. To say nothing of COVID, but just the uncertainty of the times. Right. Can you give us kind of a, a summary? How's the force doing? How, how are the sailors doing out there on a day-to-day, long-term uh, basis? I, I'll I, I think that our sailors are doing fantastic. It has been probably the most challenging year that I can remember in my career. And this, uh, this really has to do with COVID. Uh, and so not only, having, not, not only having ships with their eyes on, let's say, a seven-month deployment, but also having to back that up by another month with ROM and COM2X before they deploy. So uh, the Navy's been able to maintain its mission readiness. And I, I'll tell you, from the President on down to the Secretary of Defense and both, both administrations over the past year have been appreciative and proud of what the Navy's been able to do because we haven't come off mission one bit. We've been out there every single day in all those tough places, the Arabian Gulf, the high north, the western Pacific. And so as, uh, as our potential adversaries and, and, and competitors challenge us, the Navy's been where we need to be forward, pressing back, uh, showing our presence, and protecting U.S. interests. Um, uh, this, this has been a tough year for families as well. We've had some extended deployments, uh, especially uh, in the Middle East uh, with respect to um, extended deployments uh, where we've had to keep a carrier on station just because of our relations with Iran. And so I know that's been tough in the fleet, but I, I am just so proud of how they've responded. Uh, very few complaints. I know that we've got some sailors out there that uh, I, I, I can't even imagine um, uh, comparing us to a, to a, to a competitor and how, and how we eclipse them. Uh, I, I, actually, I can't imagine it based on what, based on what I've seen. Uh, our Navy is just so strong and resilient. It's been, uh, it's been refreshing. So, you, so you, you talk about being out there, forward deployed, uh, Fifth Fleet, Western Pacific, mm -hmm. High North. You released NAV Plan 2021. Uh, I think you did it at the Surface Navy uh, Association Symposium back in January. And you used some pretty tough words in that document. And, um, and it kind of created a little bit of a, of a buzz. You, you used mm -hmm. words like dominant naval force, win in day-to-day -day competition, in crisis, and in conflict, and, and you used lethal and non-lethal effects. Mm -hmm. How are those words resonating with the fleet? How are those words resonating with the sailors you're talking to? I think they're resonating well. I hope they're resonating well. The feedback that I get is really positive. The NAB plan itself was really, really designed to focus on things that I think we need to get after this decade. Uh, we cannot afford, and, and, the, and the advantages that we maintain with our peer competitor, particularly China, we need to stay in front of them. We need them looking at us and trying to catch us instead of us catching them. But there are areas where we've fallen behind and we can't afford to fall further behind. I don't want, I don't want uh, the Navy to be in a place in the next decade where we find ourselves in significant catch-up mode. So the NAB plan is really focused on those things we need to get right now. And the first thing is readiness. We absolutely have to be a ready Navy. The last year proved that uh, with the pandemic. We, we, we were the force of choice in terms of pressing forward and being out there when we needed to be. And so, um, so I think that the NAB plan has been met with uh, pretty good reviews uh, and a positive, as you said, a positive buzz from the fleet, which matters greatly. Yeah. So uh, talking about the difficulties of this year um, and being ready for it, um, COVID comes, then social injustice. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Let's go to a question from the fleet, who, to, a sailor who talks about, uh, interestingly, concerned about future pandemics. But let's hear what he has to say and then, and then take the question from there. Let's go to sure. uh, Petty Officer First Class Cedric Gordon. In preparation for future pandemics, 
what solutions are being put in place mm -hmm. to ensure watch standards are able to take over their duties while balancing crew manning requirements. Pandemics. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about uh, current pandemics, uh, current situation, mm -hmm. uh, dealing with what you're dealing with now, what you've learned about uh, to be able to operate forward. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, how are you doing with vaccinations? I mean, and, and are we able, are you able to continue to operate? We were in the news in a big way a year ago. We're, we're not in the news anymore. Yeah. It seems like everything's going pretty well. So in terms of current status, so less than uh, 0.25 or 1% of the force is positive. So less than 700 sailors out of a force of 347,000 are positive right now. And uh, at least 60% of 60% uh, of the Navy, uh, the active duty Navy has had their first shot. So we're making steady progress with respect to vaccinations. There's always a silver lining and you always have to look for a silver lining in any situation uh, as tough as it might be. And with respect to the pandemic, the silver lining that I'm most proud of is the fact that uh, when I talk about less than one quarter of 1% of the, of the fleet being positive, we've held that number consistently for months and months and months. And it's not because uh, sure, we provided some pretty solid guidance from, from headquarters here in Washington, but in terms of execution, it really comes down to individual sailors on the deck plates doing the right things with respect to wearing PPE, washing their hands, uh, uh, making sure their workspaces are clean, but also holding the sailor to the left and to the right of them accountable as well. That's the kind of individual responsibility that we aspire to as leaders at every level in the Navy. Uh, and I think it's just such a great example. And the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, you, you mentioned extremism, and I would just say that I would expect that that same type of behavior be translated to that challenge and how we deal with it individually in our Navy as well. And I think that if, uh, if people have a backbone and they, and they uh, stand up and do the right thing, just that they've done during COVID, I think we have a chance here to make some real progress while we have some momentum in this country. So you took a pretty hard stand um, back when, uh, when it was the social injustice was on the streets, mm -hmm. uh, shortly after George Floyd's death and all that. Uh, and here we are, geez, six, eight, nine months later. We have another question from the fleet on this very topic. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it, it's impressive as to what the, the thinking is out in the fleet. Mm -hmm. uh, can we go to the, the question from uh, Petty Officer Second Class Amira West, please? After the broad topic of extremism was discussed at the all hands stand down, what is the Navy's long-term plan to discuss topics relevant to the conversations, such as what it means to support and defend the Constitution? Thanks, Petty Officer West, that's a great question. Uh, in short, we need, to, we need to continue to have honest conversations at the deck plate levels. Where leaders uh, at every pay grade are meeting, are meeting with their sailors and talking through these tough issues. It's taken, one, one of the things that we learned through those listening sessions that we did as part of Task Force One Navy um, is that people came forward, I, I would say courageously with stories uh, the, of, of discrimination as they've experienced. Um, both, uh, b both negative experiences, but also positive experiences that have opened the eyes of many people, including me, uh, obviously not a minority and I've never been challenged in that way. Um, but it's been enlightening and I think empowering as well for each one of us to recognize how terrible a scourge racism is and discrimination, whether it be racial, whether it be ethnic, whether it be gender, uh, and how we shouldn't stand for it, how we wouldn't want anybody to treat us like that. Uh, and so we shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, allow uh, other sailors to be treated like that. And if I go back to the example that I just spoke to a few minutes ago about how sailors courageously stood up and did the right thing during the pandemic and held each other accountable. That's what I would expect that we do with respect to that awful scourge of racism uh, uh, and ethnic discrimination uh, and gender discrimination, that we take a stand there as well. That's the only way we're gonna get after this. I can do videos, I can put out messages, uh, but it's not gonna have the effect in the deck plates as a, you know, I don't care what pay grade you are, uh, that you're taking a stand and you're not gonna put up with it. Are you seeing progress? Are you, are you hearing, I mean, uh, uh, Task Force Navy One, uh, are, you, are you seeing results from that? We have, and so uh, in Task Force One Navy, we identified 60 different areas uh, that we're now getting after, and uh, some, would call them, some would call them areas of institutional discrimination, but 
the bottom line is it's dis th these are discriminatory practices that have existed within the Navy uh, that have to stop. And I would say that not uh, n none of them were intentional, but they existed because we all have biases and we all have blind spots. And so these listening sessions with sailors helped, uh, helped us identify these, these areas that we have to fix. Um, I do think, at least when I go around the Navy and I talk to sailors in small groups and they open up and talk to me uh, about this issue, I think uh, their message to me is that they believe that we're making progress, but we can't take our foot off the, off the pedal here. Uh, we can't fool ourselves into thinking that we're, gonna, that we're gonna solve this problem in six months or six years. This, this is a, this is a long-term challenge, not only for the Navy, but the nation. Uh, and I asked the Navy, let's do our part here. I think that we are uh, a high-performing team, and we need to act like one. Uh, we need to act like one inside inside the lifelines of every ship, but also on liberty uh, and with our families. And so I expect I have very high expectations for how we conduct ourselves as people. So, Cno, you know, before we take a break, it sounds like you're pretty high right now on how the, how the fleet's doing. You're, oh, absolutely, you're absolutely. I'm, I, I I tell you, I, I I wish I could start all over again. I wish I wish our Lieutenant JG back on my first ship. Um, I, when I go out, uh, when I go out and visit the fleet, um, I'm, I'm not sure that I could have competed uh, back in the day with the quality of sailors and officers that we have out there right now in every single community. Uh, we have a very, very strong Navy. It's always easy to be a naysayer. It's always easy to be critical. And I take plenty of criticism, and most of it's well-founded, and I'm happy to take it. Uh, but I tell you, there's also... We can never lose sight of all the goodness in the United States Navy, all the things that are going really, really well. And the sailors out there are the ones that are making it happen, and they ought to be proud of it. Thank you, CNO. We're going to take a quick break, and uh, when we come back, we'll talk a little bit about shipbuilding and the, and the size of the force, and then get actually into war fighting and what the Navy's Good. all about. I look forward to it. So uh, please remember to uh, ask questions on the platform. Uh, CNO has uh, challenged me to, uh, to, to get questions from the audience, and, uh, and so please engage, and uh, we'll be right back. Doing the right thing is what matters most, but sometimes bad things happen. When they do, we all need someone who does the right thing, and that's Navy Mutual. The Lone Sailor a powerful symbol of the sacrifice of sea service personnel, past, present, and future. For more than two decades, the Navy Memorial has placed 16 of these iconic figures around the country and the world. Now you can contribute to this story tradition and help place our next statue at one of the most significant battlefields of the 20th century, the D-Day beaches of Normandy. Be a part of history and help ensure their sacrifice is never forgotten. Make your tax-deductible donation today. Thank you and welcome back. Uh, so, you know, let's, let's talk about shipbuilding. Uh, the number 355 is, uh, is recognized, mm -hmm. it's in law, it's in policy. I hope it's in the budget. Um, but, but what does that mean in the near term? And do you, and that's the biggest part of the question. Mm -hmm. What do you see in the near term, mm -hmm. five, 10 years yeah. out? And then how do you get to 355? When do you get to 355? Great question. So 355 is the law of the land. Every single assessment that's been done since 2015, whether it's been done inside the Navy, uh, inside more broadly the Pentagon, Department of Defense, or even outside the Navy, whether it's been think tanks or academics, they've all concluded that we need a Navy a bigger than bigger than 355 ships. That number, some estimates, could grow up to, up, up north of 400 if we include unmanned vessels uh, under the sea and, and on the sea. Um, we submitted a shipbuilding plan to Congress in December of, uh, of 2020, so just a few months ago. And that plan put us on a glide slope to achieve the number 355 in the 2031 to 2033 time frame, but it was predicated on 4.1% real growth in our budget. So even though the requirement stands at at least 355, and we do have a glide path to get to 355 in, in, another, uh, in another decade, 
it's really it really requires more funding. And so um, the Navy that we have today, 60% of the fleet in the water today was commissioned uh, in, in 2001 uh, or, or before. And so it's an aging fleet and we have to take care of it. So thing one for me remains readiness, both in terms of our people and in terms of our platforms and also the modernization piece. So we need, we need to continue to modernize the ships that we have to take care of them, uh, to get them in and out of maintenance on time and, and to give them weapons with more range and more speed. So those are my priorities uh, is to ensure we have a ready, capable fleet now, modernize the ships that we have for the future. And at the same time, uh, any, uh, any money we can put towards the, the growth of the fleet, we are. Our shipbuilding budget today is twice of what it was in, uh, in 2005. It does need to continue to grow if we're going to have a larger Navy. So you, you have said uh, in conjunction with this that the next decade is so important. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I think you actually said it a lot stronger than that, right? That, that we, you have to get it right this decade. What does that mean? So, so 2030 uh, comes along. How do you know that, you, that we got the decade right? So I, I try to think about it across three domains at least. So I'm thinking about the undersea, on the scene, in the air, as well as cyber and space. And so if I could talk about, you mentioned in the near term and then in the longer term. So if I look out uh, four years to 2025, and if I look at the undersea domain, by that time, in four years time, all of our Virginia class block threes will be delivered. All of our block fours will be delivered. We'll, unbe we'll be in the cusp of delivering Virginia class block fives with a greater VLS capacity. And we've made investments to deliver a long range, more lethal torpedo. If I look at the surface domain, we're, we're delivering, or we will be delivering, uh, FFG-62, the Constellation class frigate. We'll be putting Flight 3 DDGs in the water. By 2025, we'll have hypersonic missiles on the three Zumwalt's. And we're investing in weapons with range and speed, Maritime Strike Tomahawk, and other weapons uh, that I can't talk about in a public forum that give us more punch. If we talk about in the aviation side and what's uh, flying off of our aircraft carriers, this summer, we're gonna deploy our first F-35 squadron off of Vincent. By 2025, we'll have six air wings out of 10. They're gonna be F-35 capable. We're that much closer to a fourth generation, fifth generation fighter mix with extension range, range weapons like El Razum and Argum. So these are both air to air and air to surface uh, missiles. Uh, we'll have the MQ-25s, the, the unmanned tanker flying off our carriers by 2025. Uh, we're updating our network, so in the, cyber, in the cyber world, we're making significant investments as well. We're updating our shipyards through a strategic infrastructure plan, where Congress and in, in the infrastructure bill that's being debated on the Hill right now includes money for our public shipyards. And so, uh, and so in the near term, in, in, in four years' time, that's where I see the evolution, that's where I see the investments in terms of uh, providing a Navy that's a, a bit bigger than it is today, but certainly more capable, more lethal, and definitely more ready. That's a quite a bit of force. One thing we didn't mention was autonomous unmanned vehicles, and I know that's right. high on your list. Um, and quite frankly, for us out here, uh, I don't really know what that means. Um, what is that 10 years from now? What do we see coming in and out of port in Norfolk or San Diego? What do we see operating in, in the Arabian Gulf or the West Pacific? How does this unmanned uh, unmanned ships. How do they? How, how does that fit into your fleet concept? Sure. Let me give you. Well, let me let me talk more broadly about where we where we are and where we're going with unmanned. We develop an unmanned uh, an uh, unmanned systems framework that took a look at 15 different unmanned systems that that we're developing. These are platforms that uh, that would uh, uh, operate under the sea, on the sea, and in the air. We found that these 15 systems, the 15 platforms were fairly stovepipe programs. And so we brought them all together so that we could learn from the technology and the experimentation that we're doing in each of those programs. We can make better decisions on which programs aren't going well and we need to cut and which ones that are going great and we need to probably double down on. What we'd like to do is to get after two really tough problems in the next four or five years. One of those is reliability, particularly 
with, uh, with, with the unmanned under the sea and the unmanned on the sea so that they can operate extended periods of time with very high reliability. The second thing that we really have to solve is command and control. And so we need to have a network structure that allows us to command and control these with a high degree of reliability. With respect to manned surface, I don't think we're gonna go fully unmanned for a while. Although, I'll give you an example of a recent uh, test that we did. We took, a, we took an unmanned vessel from the Gulf Coast through the Panama Canal up to Port Wainimi, California. Uh, and so 90, 98% of that transit was done fully autonomously. Nobody um, on board. No, no, there was somebody on board, but their hands were off the controls. So it. it was all done with, uh, uh, with AI capabilities. Um, so we're feeling more confident about that, but I think it'll be some time before those unmanned platforms are truly unmanned. I would say into the 2030s, uh, and, and probably for an extended period of time, they're gonna be minimally manned. So maybe a, maybe a crew of, of just a few people, right? Uh, so that th so that if there's a problem with a with a clogged filter in a, in, a, in a fuel line, let's say you have somebody on board to be able to take care of that. Um, and, and so if I use unmanned surface as an example, I could see a large unmanned surface vessel that would serve as an adjunct magazine in a surface action group, let's say with a new Constellation class frigate, and let's say a Flight 3 DDG, and then I'd have this adjunct magazine, this large uh, unmanned unmanned vessel that would have nothing but VLS cells. Um, or we may have a medium unmanned vessel and it might have laser technology that would act in an anti-ballistic missile defense role, right? And so uh, this would free up our missiles for, for land attack or long range strike and allow us to defend the fleet uh, and, and provide more, more survivability by using laser technology. Um, and I, I, actually, I'd like to come back to laser technology maybe when we talk about, uh, when we get deeper in, into some other questions. With, with respect to unmanned in the air, um, I talked about the MQ-25, and so that frees up uh, a Super Hornet from a tanker roll, which honestly is an inefficient way to use a, use, a, mm -hmm. use a fighter. It actually extends the range of the air wing off the carrier. That, along with uh, a longer range weapon, gives us much more range, speed, and punch, uh, offensive punch uh, against, our, against our rivals. I don't want to talk about the capabilities of the, uh, of the unmanned under the sea because they're, they're highly classified, but that's an area where we've been making really, really good progress. Uh, but again, I want to get us to a place in a few years where we're very confident in the reliability and the command and control aspects so that we can then uh, confidently uh, within the Pentagon and uh, within the Congress make a case to scale uh, the numbers of those vessels. So um, I, I'd like to do a, a kind of a rapid fire through some of the platforms. Mm -hmm. Before we do that, though, I have a question from Sink Harris, which com, uh, comes in line with a lot of the things you're talking about, quite frankly, the expense of, of what we're mm -hmm. talking about. And, um, and Admiral Sink Harris, who always knows how to write, get right to the issue, uh, has a discussion regarding rebalancing the one-third split on the budgets between the military services damaged military to military relations? It is not, at least, at least not for the Navy. Um, uh, so, as most people can see, I'm, act, I'm, I'm operating lockstep with the Commandant of the Marine Corps. Um, his, uh, his planning guidance and where he's taking the Marine Corps in terms of working hand in glove with fleet commanders to, uh, to deliver sea control uh, and sea denial against, against an adversary is something that we desperately need. Uh, the Army is talking about long range fires and the Army is talking about how they can contribute to uh, to sea control and sea denial, and the Air Force similarly. And so uh, I'm making the strongest case uh, that I can make for, uh, for the capabilities that the Navy brings to the fight within the joint force. The Navy's concept of distributed maritime operations is foundational to the joint warfighting construct that the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs is just about ready to sign out. This, isn't a, this, this is a concept that along with the, with the Marines and their Loki and their EABO concepts, is maturing. There isn't an ARG or a strike group that deploys or returns from deployment today that isn't, that isn't uh, doing a fleet battle problem that's testing at aspects of distributed maritime operations. We're gonna do our largest exercise in a generation this summer. It's called Large Scale Exercise 2021. Multiple strike groups, multiple ARGs. We're making big gains in live virtual constructs. So 
we are leveraging technology from the gaming community in order to give us the ability to integrate all of our platforms so that we can train and, and get those reps and sets in uh, much more readily than we can today. Why? Because we just can't afford to do large scale exercises every year. It costs a lot of money to get that iron underway, and we can uh, uh, and we can do it with a degree of uh, with, with a degree of rapidity uh, that allows us to test some concepts out more fully. Um, but but the short answer is, um, with respect to the other services and the other service chiefs, sure there is definitely uh, it's a competitive environment right now, uh, but. Um, I remain very confident that the Navy has a sound case here for what we're delivering to the Joint Force. And uh, I am parochial, of course, as a service chief, but I truly believe that the Navy is providing substantial, uh, substantial uh, lethality and capability to the Joint Force and, the, and contributing to the, potentially to the kind of fights that we're going to be in in the future. So, so you know, you, your focus today is really on the operations uh, mm -hmm. how the Navy is being used. Um, I'd like to do a rapid fire through some platforms, mm -hmm. but more so focusing on how the platform fits into the operations sure. than the status of the number of ships being built this year or the budget sure. status or whatever. And maybe just start with littoral combat ship uh, and we'll work our way from smaller to bigger. Littoral combat ship, where do you see it fitting in the future? Littoral combat ship, we got 33 of them. We got to wring the most uh, operational availability that we can out of those ships. The blue and gold crewing concept is sound. Uh, there is plenty of work for these ships to do, whether it's in Southcom right now. You just heard from Admiral Fowler during his testimony a couple weeks ago how high he is on LCS performance. The same thing in the Western Pacific. The 7th Fleet Commander just came back to meet with me for a couple hours to give me his report on, on his operational, not only his use of LCS today, but his plans in the future. Um, we're going to get the combining gear fixed uh, on, the, on the odd class uh, LCSs. The vendor is doing land-based testing right now, uh, and once that new design is proven, we will, we will first uh, install those new combining gears in the ships that are delivering out of Wisconsin, and then we'll, backfill, uh, we'll backfit some of our older hulls. Uh, we're putting uh, the Naval Strike missile on every single LCS, and we're in, on the cusp of in the next 18 months delivering both the, uh, the MCM modules and the ASW modules, which I'm, which I'm excited to get those on those ships. I'm very bullish about LCS. When I go aboard those ships, uh, for, the, for those who haven't been on an LCS or haven't been on LCS in a while, I will tell you that those ships are really, those crews are really well trained. Uh, they, they are eager to get back to sea and contribute. And uh, we, got, we got roles for them, not only down in Fourth Fleet, uh, out in 5th Fleet, we intend to put them forward in 5th Fleet, and of course in 7th Fleet. They were, they were designed to operate inside close to land uh, and, and, and transit at high speed, and you better believe we're going to make use of that capability in the Western Pacific. So let's move to uh, the new frigate, FFX Constellation class uh, frigate. Where does that fit in in 10 years? So that fits into our design and distributed maritime operations. So based on the assessments we've done in terms of we have a really good understanding of how we're going to fight with distributed maritime operations. We folded that into a series of really robust war games and assessments that allowed us to better understand what we need to fight with. So the Constellation class frigate, in terms of where the fleet's going, you're going to see if, again, if, if budgets maintain where, where we hope that they will to support a larger, more capable Navy, uh, you're going to see smaller ships, so that's more frigates, uh, and you'll see less ships that are cruiser size, right? And so we believe that uh, in order to fight in a more distributed way, that we can do that with, we can do that, uh, we can do that with smaller ships. Um, you'll have your Flight 3 DDGs that'll take over that um, air, uh, and integrate, that, that integrated air defense role that the cruisers now, that the cruisers now fill. And uh, we'll be in the cusp, let's say in 2027, 2028, of building DDGX, and so, uh, the next class of destroyer, it'll be a new hull with an existing combat system. So mm -hmm. we'll do the same thing that we did when we moved from uh, when we moved from the Aegis the Aegis uh, cruisers to the destroyers. Right, mm -hmm. the combat system transferred. The hull was different, uh, but it'll be a hull that uh, allows us to have uh, bigger, more lethal uh, missiles like hypersonics. So that covers DDG, uh, DDG next uh, yep. uh, cruisers. Uh, so, uh, you know, we've come to rely on 
CG47 class. We have. Um, we've talked a lot about the major, the large combatant program. What's next after the? So DDGX will end up filling. So the, the flight three DDGs uh, that were that will begin to be putting in the water around 2025 will begin to take over for the cruisers with respect to that uh, air defense commander role. Mm -hmm. uh, DDG next will follow. Uh, mm -hmm. And so you'll see the cruisers begin to phase out. As many of them uh, have either on the cusp of 30 years or passing that 30 year service life that, was, uh, that they were designed to serve for. Uh, we're now seeing, uh, if I could make the comparison, and I know this will uh, resonate with the audience, 15 or 20 years ago, we were retiring or decommissioning Spruance class destroyers because it was too expensive to update mm -hmm. the combat system. Mm -hmm. Now uh, it's becoming too expensive to maintain the HM and E systems on these ships. We, w with the cruisers, a as an example, we see a lot of cracking. So when we bring them to the shipyard, we see a lot of growth work uh, that's difficult to for it's it's growth work because it's difficult to plan for. These ships have been under uh, an extreme amount of stress for the past 30 years, and we're beginning to see problems now manifest themselves that are becoming very very expensive to fix. So uh, I'll come back to submarines and, and carriers mm -hmm. and and uh, Joint Strike Fighter and things like that in, in a second, but you mentioned shipyards and maintenance, and I know that's high on your yeah. priority list, and, and uh, I know there's some, uh, to your point earlier, there's some money on the Hill talked about, talking about infrastructure. That just seems to be a problem that's just so darn hard to fix, um, getting ahead of the maintenance and getting ships out. So it's, it, it's been the Achilles heel for us for a while in terms of our ability to generate forces, um, and so, uh, a year and a half, two years ago, we really were only getting about 30 to 35 percent of our ships out of maintenance on time. It's difficult to go to Congress and argue for a bigger Navy if we can't maintain the Navy that we have today. And uh, honestly, maintaining ships, uh, maintaining submarines, maintaining aircraft, that's part of what we do as naval officers. And so we ought to be embarrassed if we can't get these ships out of shipyards on time. Uh, in the past year or so, we have reduced the delay days in our public yards by 80 percent. Uh, reduced our delay days in private yards by about 60%. We are not satisfied with that. Our goal is to wipe out 100% of those delay days so that we're planning those availabilities properly and we're getting the maintenance done on time. Uh, we're, not, we're not deferring maintenance. I'm not going to go back to things that happened a decade ago uh, where we, uh, we just weren't doing the maintenance. We are going to do the maintenance. Um, um, as I mentioned earlier, 60% of the fleet that we had in 2001, we still have today. And a decade from now, 70 to 75% of the fleet will be there in, in 2030. So readiness remains my number one priority. The fleet's responding to that. NAVC is responding to that. The private yards are working with us. We're now backing up where we, we used to uh, cut a contract for a destroyer or, or an amphib going into maintenance, let's say 30 days in advance. We're now backing that up to 120 days. And we're stacking those availabilities vertically more and more so that a particular uh, shipyard is going to see four or five DDGs in a row. That's, uh, that helps them plan ahead for the work with respect to their workforce, backing those contracts up to 120 days. We're not to 120 yet. That's our target. We're at about 97 days now. We're gonna, we're, our goal is to back up those contracts to about 120 days uh, so that th the material for those shipyards can be on hand. The GFE can be on hand. Uh, to help finish those jobs on time. And we're getting better at planning, uh, planning our availabilities. Based on a substantial amount of data, we found that about 30% of, of the delays uh, in shipyards, whether it was public or private, could be directly attributed back inside the lifelines to poor planning up front. And so my message in every chief's mess goes back to the, the CSMP. I mean, this is back to you know, blocking and basic blocking and tackling and how important it is uh, that those jobs uh, that are initially scoped are, are done correctly. I know that was a long-winded uh, discussion about maintenance, but uh, I really believe we're heading in the right direction. I'm proud of how the fleet's responded. I know that people get it and they understand why it needs to be our number one priority. I truly believe that if we get in a fight tonight, um, that uh, the, the fleet and its commanders are going to perform at the level at which we train them and at the level of which we prepared them. We shouldn't fool ourselves. And so that readiness always has to be our number one priority. We owe it to ourselves. So let me go back to platforms a little bit and uh, take a slight uh, mm -hmm. different direction on submarines, right? Uh, the silent service, uh, we've come to know them as uh, the, underwater, the undersea threat, which w 
what's the status of that uh, over the last 20 some years. We've come to know them as Tomahawk launchers. Yep. Um, and now the future with uh, autonomous vehicles that perhaps are, are Tomahawk launches. Where do you see the Virginia class submarine? Where do you see submarines 10 years, 20 years? So the, 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 the block threes and block fours, uh, we need to deliver those on time. I think we're gonna get there. The trend right now is, is pretty good. The block fives bring a substantial amount of firepower with respect to, with respect to numbers of cells, but also in 2028, uh, right now, our goal is to put a hypersonic capability, a hypersonic missile on those Block 5 submarines. And so those Virginia-class submarines, which help give us overmatch against our, our high-end competitors, will remain a priority for me in terms of getting those, in, in, terms, of keeping the, uh, in terms of keeping the undersea force uh, updated, modernized, and, and ready to go. Um, as you know, as everybody knows, the SSBNs are no-fail mission for us and they have the highest op tempo uh, in mm -hmm. the Navy. Those uh, Ohio-class submarines are pushing 40 years. By the time they leave service, they'll be at 42 years or more uh, under the water, and those submarines see a lot of at sea time. The Columbia class is our number one priority for the nation. We have to deliver those submarines on time. I got updates nearly every day in the progress <laughs> with, the, with the builder on, uh, uh, on, on, those, uh, on, on, the, on the Columbia class. Um, so. Uh, the Columbia class is going to be a great submarine uh, that we're going to be very proud of, I predict. Uh, the Ohio class has stood us uh, stood the test of time since since the 80s. I will say um, the Navy, the nation, has not been in, in the type of environment, this type of environment, since the early 80s. So back in that time, we were updating the strategic force with the Ohio class submarines at the same time we were trying to build up the conventional force. The difference between then and now is that the average DOD budget, the annual rate of growth back then was about 7.5% a year, when right now our buying power has been flat since 2010. Uh, meanwhile, with, with an aging fleet, you see both operation and maintenance costs rise, uh, rise greater than the rate of inflation, and certainly we see the same for personnel costs. So those are pressure points on a budget. If it doesn't grow, uh, it becomes difficult for us uh, to grow capacity at a greater, uh, at, at the rate that we want. Mm -hmm. So the Columbia class submarine, your number one, not only your number one priority, but stated number one priority for the nation. Right. Um, big bill, big plan. What, 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 how do you assess the program going forward? I mean, it, history is marked with big first priority programs yep. that just become problematic as we chip away at it. When does it hit the fleet? And, and is, it, is the transition with the Ohio class going to be as smooth as you uh, are hoping it's going to be? Yeah, so um, I'm very optimistic. So if I make a comparison to Ohio, um, at this time in the build, so we're, we're, we're bending metal right now in, on the Columbia. Uh, at this point in the build in Ohio, we, we had about 12 to 15 percent of the design complete. With Columbia, we're at 85 percent. So a marked difference here with respect to the maturity of the design. So you, know, you talk about building an airplane as you're flying it. Uh, this, we're, we're taking a much more disciplined, rigorous approach with Columbia. We are buying, uh, we, we are buying parts, we are, we, are buying, uh, we are buying parts for those submarines now so that we have them on standby, ready to go. We don't want any delays. The first submarine will go in the water in 2028 and it will be on patrol by 2031. And right now that remains, uh, that remains on glide slope. 2031. 10 years. 2031, right. Yeah. Right. So that's another one of those end of the decade it is. measures, right? And, and so, so there's, three, um, there's three big areas of strategic investment for us right now. One of them certainly is the Columbia class SSBN. The second one are the shipyards. And so our dry docks are 100 years old, on average just shy of 100 years old. We've got 21 dry docks across four public shipyards. They do all of our maintenance on carriers. SSBNs, SSGNs, SSNs, they have, we have to be able to sustain that into the future. The, the infrastructure in those shipyards is over 60 years old. So we're making significant investment. These, these, these are once in a century investments in these shipyards that I'm not gonna come off of, at least while I'm CNO. Um, it has to be a priority. And then the last is strategic sea lift. So we haven't bought, we haven't bought sea lift in, in numbers since the 80s. Uh, we have fallen behind uh, from where we need to be. So we're doing surface life extensions on those ships that I think, that we think 
uh, still have service life left. Uh, and we also have done some really good market analysis, and Congress has helped us by giving us the authorities to buy used ships. And so we're going to take those ships that we think still have a good 20 years of service life left on them. We're going to do some minor modifications. And at a tenth of a cost of a new ship, we're going to be able to replenish some of that fleet. So those are three areas that we yeah. have to keep a press on. So wrapping up platforms and talking about strategic, the carriers, the Ford, uh, getting much better reviews now, huge technologi technology leap, John F. Kennedy yeah. coming on. How are the carriers doing? Great. So, uh, so Ford, so Ford, w Ford had, uh, as I mentioned, eight, 80, over 8,100 uh, cats and traps. Uh, if you go down and talk to the sailors that work on work, work in those catapults and work in the arresting gear, these are the same sailors that worked in the these are the same sailors that worked in the Nimitz class, and they'll tell you that they're not looking back. They'll stay in the Ford class carriers. They like the reliability. Uh, they like the fact that. Uh, they like the fact that uh, they're not operating in hut spaces and, uh, and, and that the systems are really performing up to specifications. Um, those ships, the Ford has had, the, has had one of the highest up tempos in the Navy over the past year. So she's been underway as much as she's been in port. It's just about a 50 to 50 uh, mix in terms of import time and at sea time. And we've been able to continue uh, doing the work uh, with, uh, uh, with HII while the ship's been underway. So we're bringing shipyard workers out there with us uh, while, uh, while the ship's underway. They're about to enter their shock trials this summer. They'll go through another maintenance phase in the fall into next winter. And then our intentions are to deploy forward in 2022. So last but not least, uh, aviation, uh, fighters, Joint Strike Fighter, Super Hornet. Uh, we met, you, you talked about autonomous unmanned yep. air aviation earlier, but How's Joint Strike Fighter coming into the fleet? Yeah, so Joint Strike Fighters run a little bit behind. Uh, I was just down in Fort Worth in a production line a couple of weeks ago. I love the capability. And, um, and so when you talk to the pilots and, and fourth and fifth gen fighters, so Super Hornets and Joint Strike Fighter working together, tremendous capability. And we're learning every day more and more about how, how much more effective we can be with that fourth gen, fifth gen mix. As I mentioned earlier, first uh, deployment on Vincent this summer with an F-35 squadron. And we're keeping pace to have six squadrons by 2025. I think we'll make that. Uh, we're giving those, um, those aircraft longer range weapons. On the Super Hornets, we're upgrading our Super Hornets to take them from 6,000 flying hours uh, up to, uh, to 10,000. And so I was just out at Boeing in, uh, in St. Louis, some of those, looking at some of those, block, looking at that Block 3 upgrade uh, work on those aircraft as well. Uh, I'm very, very optimistic about the path we're heading in with not only not only fourth and fifth gen man, but also some highly classified unmanned systems that we continue to invest in. Again, we're learning from what we're doing with MQ-25 as a tanker, and we will continue to learn from that, uh, the integrating that unmanned capability into the fleet. And then I think uh, uh, we, are, we are doing the work right now, the stubby pencil work on the uh, next generation air wing, and uh, we're pretty excited as we work that in conjunction with the Air Force. In conjunction with your work in the next gen? Sure, the Air, Air Force is working yeah. on unman unmanned just as we are. And mm -hmm. uh, so going into the 2030s, we see potentially if remain on glide slope with the technology and the testing uh, and, and, and the budget, uh, that we could have up to about 40% um, of, of an air wing could be unmanned. And then that would increase to 60% by the late 2030s. Okay, let's talk about your favorite topic, uh, war fighting, readiness, being out there and uh, doing what the Navy's doing. Um, we have a great question from Senior Chief Kyle Hall, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll go to that and uh, lead into a conversation to let's go around the globe. Senior Chief Hall. With an ever-changing enemy, whether it be North Korea, China, or Russia, where do you see our fleet's primary focus in the world of global deterrence and maritime superiority? Thanks, Senior. So uh, the NDS remains our North Star in terms of what we need to be prepared to do. And there's, uh, uh, there's a number of mission sets, right? So one is to defend the homeland, but there's also a strategic deterrence requirement. There's a conventional deterrence requirement. Uh, there's, a, there's a requirement to be able to respond to threats. There's a requirement to be able to assure our allies and partners, and also to be able to compete below the level of competition. And that is against uh, the five problem sets at the top of the heap are China and Russia. 
So the short answer to your question is we have to be able to do all five of those things, or five or six of those things, against those uh, problem sets, China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, and then uh, violent extremist organizations. But certainly China is our pacing threat. They are at the top of the heap. Uh, they are our number one competitor. And so I think, um, I think that the, uh, as, as the national defense strategy is updated going, going probably into, into 2022, as this administration takes a round turn on the existing strategy and sees what it needs to update, I think in general you will see those five problem sets remain the same. And I think the missions will probably remain, remain fairly consistent. The Navy plays big in all of those. And so I talked about SSBNs and the significant responsibility we have to, with a nuclear deterrent against both China and Russia, but also with a, with a conventional deterrent as well. In order to deter conventionally, the Navy has to be forward. That's what we do. That's why it was so important during the pandemic to be able to, to maintain that one third of the Navy at sea and most of that forward. That's where we do our nation's business. That's where the nation needs us. Uh, and that's where we deter anybody uh, that has any ideas about doing something that's going to either harm us or our allies. So uh, let's talk about China for, for a bit then. Um, a lot of freedom of navigation operations. Um, <clears throat> I wake up in the morning and I'm waiting to hear the, read the story about scraping paint or, or maybe shots fired. Mm -hmm. um, are freedom of navigation operations, are they making a difference? Um, how are they going? Uh, do you see them continuing the way they're going? And what's your concern about China continuing to put uh, more ships into zones that we're pretty concerned about? So with respect to freedom of navigation and FONOPS, so we do those around the globe. Not only Ch when, we, when we conduct them against China, they tend to get the most press. But we also do them uh, against our allies and partners when we think that their maritime claims are excessive and not in accordance with international law. Somebody once told me that armies and air forces come together in war, but navies come together all the time. And so you see us operating with like-minded navies to, inform, to, to enforce international norms uh, in waterways around the world. And we just saw in the Suez Canal last month how important it is that those waterways remain open, that nobody uh, considers blocking any of them intentionally. And although that ship that went sideways in the Suez certainly wasn't intentional, the cost on a day-to-day -day basis of that incident was about nine to $10 billion. So we can't afford to have that happen in the Strait of Hormuz or in the Strait of Malacca and the Panama Canal or any other major choke point or any other major trade route, quite frankly. And so that work we do in day in and day out with our allies and partners, and there's not a day when we're not doing that kind of work with our allies and partners, sends a signal to those who like to skirt the law or who like to, like to break it. Uh, that there are plenty of us out there, like-minded, uh, who, uh, who want to enforce it. And hopefully, you know, the idea would be to hopefully change minds uh, and change behavior so that people obey the law. And uh, everybody knows that uh, in, order to, in, in order to prosper globally, for the global economy to, to, uh, to be healthy, uh, maritime trade has to, has to be very healthy. So staying with China, we have a question here from the audience uh, about the status or an update of standing up uh, First Fleet uh, out in the Indo-PACOM AOR, and do you see that happening? So um, the Secretary of Defense just or he ordered a, a global posture review. We're going through that right now. Uh, the considerations with respect to First Fleet uh, will, be, uh, will be discussed or are being discussed during that posture review. I think the new Indo-PACOM commander will have an opinion on uh, on on uh, first fleet, um, and so uh, we've yet to make a final decision on implementation of, of uh, first fleet. So another question uh, from from the audience, and they're they're lighting up here now that we're talking uh, war fighting operations. Mm -hmm. John Mastercola uh, is asking just how significant of a threat in the South China Sea is the PRC Navy. I think they're a significant threat. So I think you see their bold activity against. Countries like Vietnam and the Philippines are a signal um, uh, of what they, uh, what they continue to intend to do with respect to putting pressure on their neighbors uh, and, and particularly on their economic activity, right? They're squeezing them. Uh, and so our steady presence out there assures our allies and partners that we have their back uh, and that we operate closely with them and stand up to China. Uh, and we don't accept that, to show them that we don't accept that kind of behavior. But in order to be relevant, we got to be there, right? We have to have 
We have to have our hulls forward. We have to be flying. We got to be sailing uh, both on the sea and under the sea. So uh, those forward operations are important. They make a difference. Um, virtual presence is actual absence. We got to be there. So let's move to Russia. Um, uh, question from the, the audience here about uh, the Russian Navy's role in Ukraine and, uh, and also just your, your look on Russia. Nuisance, threat, um, they're starting to, to push us, our buttons a little bit at sea, it looks like. Uh, what are your thoughts on Russia? Yeah, so I don't discount Russia. I mean, they, they can be a problem. And uh, so their uh, uh, subclass submarine is uh, certainly a very advanced submarine. Uh, that's uh, that's problematic, and so I take them seriously, and I think that Admiral Burke over there uh, at Navier takes them. I know that he takes them seriously. I've really admired how Navier and Sixth Fleet have used the forces that they have, not only in the Eastern Mediterranean where, where the Russians are operating in force, but also in the High North and in the Black Sea in a very unpredictable way. In my opinion, uh, Navier has been uh, been giving the Russians fits with respect to their operating patterns. And they're doing it um, innovative, innovatively, probably isn't the right word, but they're just very agile in terms, of, uh, in terms of moving our ships around at a moment's notice in highly effective ways. I just mentioned uh, uh, in, the, in the intro, uh, pushing the EOR up, up north with the, uh, off, off of Norway, which nobody expected, uh, or we, we don't think anybody expected. And so they're gonna continue to do those kinds of things, I think, and, uh, and press back at the Russians. So uh, you've mentioned High North a couple times. You mentioned the, the sending the org up. Uh, question from Jeremy Abraham: uh, What can the defense industrial base do to prepare the Navy for the Navy's needs in the High North? Um, that's a good question, and so I think that a lot of that really has to do with uh, with our training and readiness. But um, in terms of um, in terms of capabilities, I think now with you know, the effects of sea level rise, and we see the ice cap uh, significantly receding, that's gonna become a very, com a more and more competitive space up there. And so we have to be operating up there more. And as I, I mentioned earlier, some 20 some odd operations and exercises, that's gonna continue. We are gonna be present in the high north and up in the Arctic and operate up there freely and, and effectively. So, you know, one, one more uh, area I'd like to cover is the Arabian Gulf. We have a question from Lieutenant William mm -hmm. Kruger uh, here about uh, the Arabian Gulf. If we could go to that question, please. When we withdraw all of our forces from Afghanistan, what changes, if any, do you foresee in our fifth fleet operation? That's a good question, Lieutenant Kruger. So, uh, first and foremost, uh, the CENTCOM AOR is a maritime AOR. So, we've got three major choke points the Suez, the Bab el Mandeb, and the Strait of Hormuz. Significant uh, merit, significant. Um, global trade routes, right? Uh, so oil, as an example, is a global commodity. And although the U.S. is much, much less dependent upon foreign oil uh, than we were uh, years ago, it's a global commodity. And so if there's any perturbation in the Strait of Hormuz or in the Bab el-Mandeb and the Suez, we're going to feel that ripple effect back here at, at, at gas stations back home. And so we need to be present. The question is, what should that posture look like for the United States Navy in that AOR on a day-to-day -day basis. My take is that uh, as, we, as we continue these negotiations with Iran on a JICPOA next, uh, that, uh, that hopefully uh, Iran be, begins to behave uh, in an acceptable way, uh, and that'll lead to uh, a reduced requirement uh, for, let's say, a 1.0 carrier strike group presence. I do think we need to maintain a presence in, in that AOR. And the Global Posture Review that I mentioned a few minutes ago, That'll help inform the Secretary of Defense on what that posture ought to be. Whether it's Russia or whether it's China, you can't just consider those confined to an AOR. We've got, we're competing with them. Uh, we are deterring them transregionally and uh, across all domains. And so the Chinese are operating in that AOR. The Russians are operating in that AOR. We have some responsibility there to be able to compete, as I mentioned before, below the level of armed competition and be able to be below the level of armed conflict and be able to compete with them, be able to assure our allies and partners that we're there for the right reasons to help them to maintain uh, a healthy uh, global economic um, posture. So, CNO, you know, we're, we're running out of time. We've covered a lot of topics. Um, I think I better ask about Project Overmatch because I'm, I'm getting yeah. crushed on the platform and I think it's important to you too. 
Um, so how, how, is, uh, how is that progressing? Really well. Um, so Task Force Overmatch is the Navy's contribution to JADC2, or Joint All Domain Command and Control. In short, what we need to be able to do is put ourselves in a position where we can both decide and act faster than any adversary. And so uh, if I combine that with the fact that we're going to be operating unmanned and there's a command and control element there that's going to consume more and more bandwidth, that our network structure today cannot, is, is not the network structure that we're going to need to fight off of in the future as we enter the 2030s. And so my challenge to Admiral Small out at Nav War was to, uh, was, was to develop a software-defined network of network structure that allows us to transfer data, any data that we want, on any system that we want or any network that we want, and to use battle management aids or applications to allow us to get the right information at the right time to put ourselves in a position of advantage against any competitor. So let me give you an example, and if I drew a parallel to your smartphone. Your smartphone right now is probably connected to a Wi-Fi network and, and then also to a 4 or 5G network from your service provider. And your phone, the software in your phone, makes a determination of what path the data is going to take uh, to and from your phone. You really don't care what path that is. It's figuring out that software is driving the most efficient means to move that information. And then you have microprocessing in the applications in your phone that help you make whatever decisions that you have to make. It's the same, it's the same kind of approach that NavWar is taking. And so they are doing four different spirals this year that increase both the amount of applications and the networks that we're, that, that we're experimenting with. I'll give you an example. We've taken NavMax data, or normal message traffic that, that goes out to, to the fleet, and we've uh, bundled that in a way, or containerized it, and passed it on a tactical fighter network that we use, uh, that we use to communicate between Super Hornets. And we've done that with other systems as well. The technology exists without getting into a, a concrete one single data standard to take legacy uh, data constructs that we have and to be able to, to, be able to wrap them, if you will, and, or put, them, put a wrapper on them and to move them over any network. So the technology exists to do it. Nav War, it, that's their number one priority. After Columbia, it's my number one priority because I really think that we're going to be challenged to fight in the future no matter what platforms we have. If we, we've got to be able to communicate with each other and that data has to be able to transfer on many different networks on many different levels and be able to do so securely. I hope that's helpful with respect yeah, to overmatch. Yeah, very helpful. And, and uh, we're out of time. Let me ask one question because you talked there about fight, the fight. Mm -hmm. and, um, and maybe bring it all the way back to the beginning here about the sailors. Um, uh, the possibility of the fight the possibility of conflict. Um, it almost seems like we're on the edge here. Are the sailors ready to fight? What are they, what's their reactions when you're, when you use words like this yeah. on a mess deck or the hangar deck, um, are they ready to fight? I think so. Um, so if we go back to last week in the Northern Arabian Gulf, PC up there um, had an interaction with an IRGCN FIAC. The CO made exactly the right call, 10 uh, warning shots in the water as that vessel would not respond to whether it was visual signals or whether it was, whether it was bridge to bridge. And that CO made the right call in both maneuvering his ship and, uh, and putting those warning shots in the water. Uh, we see similarly really good judgment calls by COs in, in tough situations in the Western Pacific. I think I, I couldn't be more proud of uh, of how we're moving forward as a Navy. When I go on surface ships and I meet these, these witties uh, that, are, that are highly qualified uh, in disciplines like amphibious operations and much more qualified than, 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 than you and I were back in the day, mm -hmm. integrated air and missile defense, anti-submarine warfare, they're not, just, uh, they're not just interested in it, they're the best in the world at it. And so uh, it's the same thing in the aviation community. In the submarine community, you go up to Groton and they have the Fight Club. I don't know if you heard about this, <laughs> where they put wardroom against wardroom in these tactical scenarios. It's competitive. 
Uh, and so we are learning from each other as we put ourselves in those times of situations. Every Comp 2X we do now has unmanned involved. We just did an integrated battle problem on the, on the West Coast. We had unmanned under the sea, on the sea, and in the air, along with zoom waltz and LCSs and maritime targeting cells on board uh, the Michael Monsoor that was passing uh, targeting solutions to a remote platform doing live fire exercises, drones dropping sonar buoys. I, we're doing stuff that, you know, uh, the fleet's moving faster than I can keep up with them, to be honest with you. Uh, I just need to make sure that they get the right stuff to do what they need to do. Um, I, I just, uh, f for, for anybody out there listening from a ship or listening from the, from the tactical edge, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, keep pushing yourselves. And don't be, just, don't be settle with, uh, with just, um, you know, just making the grade. Push for excellence. We need to be the best in every area. So, you know, I was going to ask you, you want to make closing remarks, but that sounds like a yeah. pretty, pretty great way to end it. I don't know if I could say anything. I don't, I don't <laughs> say any more, more pointed than that. Yeah. Uh, I am very proud of what we're doing. Um, I, I, I appreciate the skepticism out there and, and some of those questions. I, could, I can kind of catch it, and it's okay. Uh, we, ne we need to be self-critical. At the same time, I also want you to be really confident uh, in terms of what you're doing and where we're going. Well, CNO, thank you for joining us. Uh, Thanks, it's my personal honor to be able to sit here with a CNO and ask some questions. And, uh, and, I, and I can't tell you enough how much, on behalf of everybody here at the Naval Moreland, I think everybody who, the Naval enthusiasts around the world, how much we appreciate your leadership you. and uh, what you're doing to put it out there for the United States Navy. Thank you, sir. Likewise. Thanks, Frank. So thank you very much for joining us today. This has uh, been a, a, a pretty intensive one hour of conversation uh, with the CNO. I really appreciate him giving us the, uh, the sit rep. Um, I would like, again, like to thank Navy Mutual Aid and General Dynamics for, uh, for sponsoring us today. Our next event uh, online is the Memorial Day wreath laying ceremony on uh, Memorial Day. Uh, we don't know yet whether we'll have a live audience or not. Probably not. We'll be really safe with COVID as we have been, but we definitely will be online. And until till then, uh, we wish you uh, fair winds and following seas. Thank you very much.